try to make this area. Make this area. All good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, today's lecture is uh, uh, not our usual lecture, but rather uh, we'll go through a tutorial on Verilog hardware design language, and then uh, sort of a show and tell slash walk you through uh, the process of taking a design and mapping it to an FPGA board, uh, partly as a uh, as preparation for uh, the optional design assignment. So uh, Salma, who hopefully half the class should know, that's your TA, uh, she's going to talk about Verilog. Uh, she has worked in this area uh, prior to coming to UCLA when she used to work for one of the EDA companies called Mentographics. Uh, so she kind of design chips and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, so she'll go over Verilog. Um, and then uh, Paul Martin, who is uh, soon to be Dr. Martin, uh, he is, uh, as you might gather, a senior PhD student. And uh, he enjoys working with hardware, software, and also uh, he was a TA for this course last year. Uh, but anyway, he helped pull together uh, this whole design assignment and kind of the whole tool chain and stuff like that around it. Uh, so he'll kind of both, like I said, do a show and tell of like what's involved, but also uh, the specific tools and all that we are going to be using. So roughly speaking, I don't know, Salma, you'll take what, 45 minutes, an hour or something like that? Yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> so the first half of the class would be Salma's and then Paul probably around half an hour, 40 minutes. So. Uh, and uh, since we have some hardware and all, so one of the things that Paul has sort of arranged is there's a little camera out here so that you get to see what is happening on the board up on the screen. Uh, feel free to sort of uh, come and uh, sort of uh, talk with him and all towards uh, the end of the presentation as well. So without wasting more time, I'll let uh, Okay. Okay, hello everyone. So today we'll start an introduction on uh, Verilog. So uh, what we ha you have been taken in the class uh, in the class this quarter is you design the hardware using gates, right? What if we have a language that can describe these gates and actually tell you, no, you need a mux, you need an and, you need an or, so you don't need to actually define the logic yourself. No, you say what you want and leave the how to a tool to do it for you. Okay, so this is why we need the hardware description language, the HDL, and there are a uh, different language for it. One that you're going to take today is the Verilog. So it's widely used in the design of digital integrated circuit, and it's used in different stages in designing the IC, the integrated circuit. First, in designing the hardware itself, simulating it, making sure that it works correctly, making sure that the timing analysis is correct, like you took last class. And also to make sure that when you download the, what you have designed or what you have wrote into the hardware, okay, it works correctly. It works as you want. Okay? So it's not, it's not new. The, the language has been going back till, uh, to 1980s, so it's, it has been there for a while. So this is the design flow when you design a Verilog or when you design a hardware description language. At the beginning, you system analyze and partitioning, like what we did. We have the data path, we have the control path, we have the part that do the logic, the combinational logic. So at the beginning, when you look at what you want to do, you partition it. You want this part to be the control, you want this part to be the data path, and so on. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. So this is the design flow for, for Verilog. Uh, at the beginning, as we said, that you partition your, your design into parts, okay? And then you write the Verilog code for it. We will see how you can going to do that. And then write test cases for what you have wrote to make sure that it works correctly. Then you make simulation, okay? What is simulation? It's a word that you're going to hear a lot in the hardware design. It means that you verify the functionality of what you wrote. Okay, does it work as you want or not? Does the timing constraints work or not? Okay, is there a timing violation 
Well, no, this is at the beginning, okay? After you write your very low code and make test cases, you simulate it. That's the meaning of simulation. And then when you make sure that everything works as you want in the simulation stage, you go to something called synthesis. Synthesis is a tool that is used in order to transfer what you have wrote to actual gates, to ands or muxes and so on, okay? And different uh, boards have different allowable gates. Not all boards supports all gates, okay? So that's why the census tool required to have what is the architecture, what is the board that you want to synthesize your gates on. Some boards don't have muxes, for example. Some boards doesn't have decoders, okay? So you have to provide the architecture of the board so that the synthesize tool can map what you have wrote to the gates that are allowable on this board. Then the next step, after you do the synthesis, you, the synthesis tool will generate something called an netlist. The netlist is just a textual description of the gates that will describe your logic, okay? So it's something that looks like this. It's a text that says, okay, you have ands, you have ors, you have inverters, you have wires that connect the ands to the ors, and so on, okay? So the output is an actual text that describes this logic. Then there are something called simulate at gate level, but you are, you are not going to um, go through how you do simulation at the gate level. But in general, in practice, it's common to spend like 70 to 80% of the design cycle just writing the very log and testing it and making sure that it works correctly, and only 20 to 30% in the verification of the gate, in the simulation of the gates, okay? Then the last step is actually make the device, program the, the hardware. There are two types. One is called the FPGA, which Paul will, will show you, and the other one is called ASIC. ASIC is application specific. Once you fire or deploy your design on your ASIC, it's targeting just a certain or a specific application. The FPGA, think of it as a breadboard, okay? It's something that you can, um, deploy different designs on it as if it's a prototype, okay? You are deploying different design, you are testing it, and it's usually used for small applications in general, okay? So this is the design flow, and we will try to talk about each part of it in this, um, in this talk. Yeah, so at the beginning, when you write your very low code, you will hear something called RTL design, register transfer level. So it's not just writing very low code. No, you have to write a very low code that can be synthesizable, that can actually be transferred to gates to, de to be deployed on the hardware, okay? The RTL design is like uh, uh, the register transfer uh, level. It's like what you have taken in the design of the FSM. You have registers, you have combination and logic, and actually the, the signal is transferred from the combination and logic to register to combination and logic to register and so on, okay? So you transfer your values through registers, okay? So that's why it's called RTL. So remember this, that you have a very lock and you want to synthesize it to actually be deployed on an IC, into an, an actual hardware. Okay, so how do you write a good synthesizable Verilog? That's what we are going to try to do. It's not sufficient that the Verilog is working correctly, but it has to be synthesizable. It has to um, work on the hardware that you want to deploy your design on. So let's start with a simple design. Suppose that you want to design this very simple logic circuit, uh, and or invert, okay? You have four inputs, A, B, C, D, and you make OR between A, B, and C, D, and then, I mean AND, and then you made um, OR invert to get the F, okay? So Verilog use concept of modules, okay? A module, you can think of it as has two parts. You define the ports, the inputs and the outputs, and you define the body, what actually this module is going to do. So there are two parts in the module, okay? The port declaration, which represents the external interface to the module, which are A, B, C, D, and F, okay? And the module body represents the internal description of the module, its behavior. So you have here two ands and one or invert, or nor, okay? So how can we do that in very long? So if you look into this snippet of the code, you will see um, at the beginning a comment 
when you write any code, you have a comment. So the comment is like the C and the Java. It has two flashes and you write your, your, your comment. And the module starts between two keywords in very long. Module and end module, okay? Between the module and end module, you write the behavior or the description of what this module should do. So if you look at the first line, which is the module name and the ports, the AOI is the name that you give to the module. It's your uh, choice. It's not a keyword in Verilog or not anything. It's just what you want to choose as a name for this module. So we choose it as AOI and or invert, okay? And then between, parent between parentheses, you will find the description of the ports. You have input A, B, C, D, and output F, okay? And then you define the behavior. We will go through that now. But then you end your module using end module, okay? So the module name is arbitrary, and it's your choice. And module and modules are very low keywords. And you must make sure that all the inputs and the outputs are defined for in the module description. So you say I have A, B, C, D as input and I have F as an output. You should define that, okay? And the ordering is not very important, but it's usually we define the inputs before the outputs, okay? Let's look now, we have taken care of the interface, the module, in module, and the ports. Now let's look at the functionality. What do we want this module to do, okay? So we say that we want to do A and B, and we want to do C and D. We are going to OR them together and invert, right? So this line is actually what we have seen. We are going to end A and B together, C and D together, take the OR between them, and then invert, okay? So this is called the module body. We assign, assign is a keyword, we assign F, which we have declared in the module description as an output, we assign this value to this description, okay? So, when you write a line like this in Verilog, in Verilog, what happens actually is whenever any value in these ports or in these signals change, the value of F will change. It's not that all of them should change at the same time for F to change, no. Any one of them changes, F will change. Okay, that's the difference okay, between um, hardware and software. And you know the, the, the symbols of OR and NOT and AND, so you can apply them as well in the Verilog code. And that's it. That's all we need to define the AND or invert gate in, in Verilog. We define the modules, we define the ports, we define the behavior, and that's it. We finish the very long code for and or invert code, uh, and or invert um, design. Now, what we have described is a very simple logic, right? Sometimes it's not that simple. Sometimes it's more complex. Okay, so that's why with the ports, we need something called wires. Wires in, is an actually electric connection. It, it representation of an electric connection. So if we look at the same design that we want to, that we have implemented, we can look that there is a wire between the AND and this OR, right? And there is another electric connection between this AND, which is CD, and the, the OR, right? So we can define these electric connections explicitly by saying that we have wire connecting the AND and the OR, and we have another wire called O, connecting the OR and the invert, okay? So, so that's why sometimes we need the wire, and the wire is, is, is used in the connection between the, the different uh, modules. So let's see for the same design, how can we put wires in it? So what you see is what you implement. What you visualize is what you implement, okay? So you see what? You see you have wire AB, you have wire CD, and you have wire called O. Okay, and you assign the values for these wires. So if you look here, you say assign AB equal A and B. So I have the wire that's called AB will have the value that is com com uh, going to compute it from A and B. And you have another wire called CD, assign it to C and D. Okay, another wire called O, assign it to AB or CD, whatever the values that come on this wire and the value that come on CD wire, 
or them together, this is going to be the assignment for while called O. And then assign, assign the invert of the value on while O to the output F. Okay? We wrote this for um, assignment in one line before, okay? But suppose that you want to explicitly assign value to a wire in your design, that's how you're going to do it. And this will do exactly like what we did, okay? Each line of these will be executed whenever any value, whether in A, B, or C, D, or A, B, or C, D, or O changes, this line will be executed, okay? They don't have to be executed in sequence. No, they can be executed concurrently. Whenever any value of these changes, the assigning of this line will change as well. Now, there are different ways to assign the wires. In the previous one, which are, is the um, first block, we use what? We define the wire, we're saying we have three wires, and then we use the assign keyword, assign A, B, for example, equal A and B. You can do another way to do it, another syntax in Verilog, called wire assignment directly, okay? You say wire A, B, while you define the wire, you put the assignment directly, so you don't have to write the keyword assign. You just say wire AB equal A and B. So these are two different ways to assign the values to the wires. And there are no advantage or disadvantage to, to, to these, to these uh, two ways of writing the wires. They are both the same. It's just for your convenience. Whatever is, is convenient for you to write in the syntax. Okay? Now what we have seen is just what? It's just one bit. Right? We have A, B, C. D and all of them com computed to one bit, you can actually define in Verilog multibus, multibit, okay? Like you wrote in your, in, uh, in your course, this is the same way, okay? You have the brackets, you define the width from 31 to 0, so you have a wire that carries 32 bits, okay? And it's called a bus. If you have a wire that carries more than one bit, it's called a bus. Now we have defined one module which makes and or invert. What if I want to use this module as a block into another design? Okay, what if I, like, like what you have taken, for example, you design the decoder using ands and or, and you use the decoder as a, as a block in other design. Okay, what if you want to do that? So there is the design hierarchy. You define different modules and then you connect them together. So you have here the and or invert module in, the, in, the, in this square, and you want to make this connection to it, okay? You want to have two inverters, and you have different inputs to it, and you want to design this hierarchy. So let's call this square, this whole design, design one. You have and or invert, the one that we have just designed, and pair of inverters. Okay, so you have something called module instance. You design different modules and you create instance from them and connect them together. Okay, so, yes. Was there a compose on a cell phone nearby or no? You didn't see them? I didn't see them. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so let me directly go to this one. So we have, if you look at module definition, you have two module definitions, right? You have module AOI, which we have just implemented that do the and, two ands, or, and invert. And you have another module definition, which make the invert of the input, assign F equal invert of A. This is like the second line in the, in the code. Okay, so you see two module definitions, one for the invert, right? And one for the and or invert. And you want to create this design hierarchy at the top. So what you do is you create instance from the module that you have defined and connect them together. So you create two invert, inverter called G1 and G3, the, the one that has green line underneath. So invert G1 and invert G3, okay? And you create an instance from the and or invert module, AOI G2. Okay, and then you connect them together. We will see how we are going to connect them together. So this is called the module instance. 
you create different definition for mod it's modularized you create different modules okay you partition them and then you connect them together using module instances so there are different ways to connect the modules with each other okay one of them is called um, module port connection and the position mapping and the other called named mapping position mapping is just when you define the module instance remember any module is defined by what inputs outputs right at the beginning of the definition of the module you say input a b c d output is f right so when you make position mapping meaning that at the position of the a i'm going to put the wire that's going to connect the other design to the input a so for example you have here what a o i g2 select b a select b f b the one two three four the four lines from the from the end okay from the bottom when you see the definition of the AOI, you see what? Input A, B, C, D, output F. So the position mapping is you look at what you want to map in the input to what you want to map in the actual design, in the full design. So look at the beginning, look at the, the, the figure. You want to connect what? You want to connect A with wire called what? Select B. So at the position of A, in the definition of the module, I'm going to write what? Select B. Can you see what I'm saying? Now let's look at what in the definition of module AOI you see input A and then B. So the next one that you're going to put in the module instance is what, what you're going to connect to the input naming B. And that in the figure we have B is connected to an input from outside called A. Okay, so you see what? Select B, comma, A. Can you see what I'm saying? Let's see the other one, C. So C, in the definition of AOI, is the third one. And it's connected in our figure, in our top design, with a wire called select. So in the third uh, argument, I'm going to put select. This is called position mapping. At the position, I'm putting the wire that I want to connect to this instance of the model. Okay? Now let's see the other one, for example, invert G1. So G1, which is the first invert, the first G invert, the input to it is what? The input to it is A and the output from it is F. So, but in my definition, in my top design, the input for it is A and the output from it is select B. So I'm putting it in the position map. Okay? The other one, now this is, will be very um, confusing if you have a lot of inputs and a lot of outputs in the definition of your module. Okay, you have to make sure that you put what you want in the right position. Okay, sometimes it will be confusing. So there is another way called what called named map. You put this is like the third one, the third um, line from down. Okay, this is a way of defining the connection of the module instance using name map instead of putting what you want in the right position no you say the port that's called a in the definition of the module i'm going to connect it to fb okay the one that is called f in my definition of the module i'm going to connect it to f okay so this is another way in creating the module instance instead of putting it in the right position, no, you make something called named mapping. This one is, is better so that you don't make mistakes in the connection of the module, so you make sure that you are connecting the right ports with the right wires, when you are connecting different modules with each other. So actually, I prefer the second one, which is the named mapping, so that we don't make mistakes, okay? Let's let's dissect the code. Okay, so so what we what I have just been saying is is what is is here is that we have uh, ports that are defined in our module interface and we map it to the wires in our top design. Okay, any question on this so far? Any question? Anything that's not clear? Ask me. If you, if you don't understand something, ask me. Feel free to interrupt me at any at any point. Yes. Um, wire. 
this one. Yeah, I, 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 I skip this. One. Okay. So sometimes, look at this one. Sometimes you define the wire explicitly, like what we did. We say we have a wire called AB. We have a wire called CD. Sometimes Verilog um, lets you make the definition of the wire implicitly if it's only one bit. Okay, if the width of the wire is only one bit, you can actually put, if you look at the, at the three lines that are marked with green here, okay, I didn't put a definition for select B as wire. Okay, but when you create a module, module instance, you say, okay, I'm connecting select B with select B from G1 and G2. Implicitly, the very log will know that this wire is connected to this wire. You don't have to explicitly define it. But that only happens for one bit width. Okay. Which which one? Select B. At the beginning, at the beginning, select B is done here. At the beginning of the start of the simulation, everything is done here. Okay. If it will confuse, you can you can of course define the wires. Okay, but that's like um, a thing that Verilog lets you do. Okay. I actually skip it so that I don't confuse you, but yeah. Thank you for asking. Any other question? Everyone understand how to make a module, how to create instance, what, uh, what are ports, how to create um, design hierarchy, how to connect uh, modules with each other? Everything is clear? Okay. So, yeah. So we finished writing a small very log um, design. Let's write a test for it. Does what we does what we do what we want actually implement what we desire or not? Okay, so we write tests for what we have designed. This is called test benches. So test benches in 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 hardware design um, consist of two parts: the stimulus and the response. The stimulus is test vectors, meaning that Assume that A has this value and this value and this value, like the A, B, C, D of the input. Suppose that the pattern of the input is 1, 0, 1, 0, okay? I want the output to be this value. Does actually the output give what I want or not, okay? So you define test vector, you define patterns for the input and patterns for, or the golden output of the output and see does actually what you see from the output is what you want or there is a mistake, okay? So it helps you in the design stage to make sure that what you have designed is actually correct, okay? So remember, the test bench is not intended to be downloaded on the hardware, no. What is intended to be downloaded on the hardware is the design. Test benches is just to test your design. It's not intended to be downloaded on the hardware. So that's why sometimes you can do things in the test bench that you can't do in the actual design, okay? You can define things, you can do uh, functions, you can do other things in the test benches that cannot be done in the actual design because actual design need to be synthesized on the gates on the FPGA. Test bench, no, test bench is just for you to make sure that it works correctly, okay? So let's, let's create a test bench for the, the design that we have just uh, implemented. So as we said, test bench consists of two parts. Stimulus and response. Stimulus is the input pattern. You define some inputs and you check the response, you check the output. Does the output match what you want or not? Okay? And there are a lot actually there are a lot of engineering in defining the inputs that will cover everything. Suppose you have a very big design, it has a lot of input patterns. Are you going to test for each different input or some inputs? some input pattern, and it will give you a significant result, okay? So actually, this part is, is important. How are you going to define the input pattern, and how are you going to see the response? So in the syntax of Verilog, how you, are, how you write the test bench now, this is different than the design. This is a test bench. So you define a module, you name it anything. So I name it design one test, for a test for the design one that we have just designed. It doesn't have any ports. Okay, in the test bench, you define a module, it doesn't have any ports. And you have initial, initial is a keyword in the very log. It's the start of your test bench. 
and you create an instance of the module that you want to test. Remember the module instance? So I'm creating an instance called M from a module called design1. Okay? And it has select, it has A, it has B, and it has F. And then the other part is the analysis. I'm going to check the output and make sure that it matches what I want. So these are the two parts in writing the test bench. So the initial, uh, initial keyword is used to start my simulation. This is the beginning of my simulation. Okay, so let's see. This is the initial block in our test bench. So it's a stimulus. The meaning of stimulus is that you enforce values for the inputs and see does it match the output or not in the analysis. So in the stimulus, you say initial and inside it, it has begin and end. Between begin and end, you put the patterns of the inputs that you want to test. So I have what? I have select, I have A, I have B, and I have F, right? So inside it, no, I don't, yeah, I have select A, B, and F is the output. So inside it, I say at the beginning, I put select equals zero, A equals zero, B equals zero. It's testing, okay? So you are forcing values. And then you see hash 10. It means after 10 time units, I am going to put A equal to 1. Then after 10 time units again, select equal 1. Then after 10 time unit, B equal to 1. So as if you are creating a wave, okay, values. After 10 units, put A equal 1. Another 10 units, put select equal 1. And see how the values are going to change. So <clears throat> it's time units. Meaning what? It's not 10 seconds, it's not 10 nanoseconds, it's, it's time units. And the unit is actually defined in the simulation tool. So you have a tool that you write your test bench on it, and it lets you say whether the time unit corresponds to one nanosecond, or the time unit corresponds to one second, or what? You define this. So it, remember, it's not 10 seconds, it's not 10 nanoseconds, it's 10 unit time. And you define the unit time in your tool. Okay, so what we have wrote here is actually this diagram, right? At the beginning, you put select A, B equals zero. Look at the, the, the timeline and see at the beginning, at zero, select A, B, were equal to zero. And then after 10 time units, I put A equal one. So you see A becomes one after 10. And then another 10 unit, you see select become 1. Another 10 unit, you see B equal to 1. So what we have just written is that we created this. We created the values of this signal. Now let's look at the response. So we created the stimulus. We created these inputs. So the inputs to our design have this shape of waves, has these values. Okay, now let's look at the result. Will it actually match what we want or not? So you write another block called the analysis block, and it's the same, initial, begin, end. And inside it, you monitor the values of F, which is the output of our design. So it's very easy to actually monitor the, the response in, in Verilog because it has a keyword called monitor, okay? So you see in this snippet, it's a syntax in Verilog, dollar sign, monitor. So monitor is a keyword in Verilog that allows you to see how the values are changing. Okay, so you are saying monitor with sign the values of select, the values of A, the values of B, and the output F. Okay, and you can put whatever uh, strain pattern that you want. Okay, it's Look at it as if it's like print F or print in C and Java. Monitor is something like this, and you are printing to the screen these values. Okay? And as you see, you see a comma space, as if when you are printing, you have a space between the time and the values. Okay? It's like, it's like the printing in the C and Java. So you are monitoring this value. If you look at the right box, you see what? At times you, A, B, C, uh, I mean select A, B, F, all have zero. Okay, so you see it's printing what zeros and then four zeros. At time zeros, select A, 
B and F all have values zero. And then at time 10, A was zero, till left was zero. And remember, we say what after 10 time units, I'm raising A from zero to one. So you see that A becomes one. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, the second line in the block, 10, after 10 time units, A has become one. So it's become what? Zero, selected zero, A has become one, B I didn't change, will the output be one or not? Now the output of F is one, this is like the last bit, F is one. Do I actually expect to have a one or not? This is the analysis, you are seeing the output. Does it match the input pattern that you have defined or not? Okay, you are testing your design. Does the output match what you want or not? Okay. So you have a keyword called monitor and another keyword called time. Time is just it's taking the time from your simulation tool. Okay, so that's why you say you just print dollar sign time and it prints for you 0, 10, 20, 30, and so on. Okay. Any question on the on this so far? Yes. This one? This one? Uh, in the test benches? This one? Okay. So do you remember the question? What was it? You mean this? End of module description, end of command? No? Okay, then maybe come after... Which? Which one? Multi-line comment, which one? Ah, you mean like um, a slash dollars, a slash asterisk? Ah, uh, okay. So I don't know where this is in the code, but he was asking, so when you put comments in your... Okay, so best practice when you write the code of Verilog or when you write any code in general, try to put comments, okay? Try to put what this line actually means. This is for you, okay? So when you write comments, it's two slashes and you write the comment. You write what you want. When you compile your code, whatever is after these two slashes is not taken in the code. It's just for you, okay? So it's two slashes and you write the comment. Sometimes... If you write, want to write like different lines of comments, like multiple lines, there's another way to do it. So you write slash, asterisk, put all your lines, and then asterisk slash. Okay, you can, you can come afterwards and I can show you that. But just, you can write slashes and your comments, okay? Okay. So, again, we are still in the test benches, okay? We write the stimulus, we write the response, and we see the output. Now... The initial makes the running only once. Initial, begin, end. It executes only once. Sometimes in your design and in your test bench, you need to execute something always. You want it to run always, okay, forever. You want this, ver this hardware to keep on running forever, okay? So you write this in something called always block, okay? So... Always is like initial. It's a block. You start it with always, begin, end. And inside it, you write all the code, or all the behavior that you want it to keep on executing forever. But you can't have something for forever, right? You have to have something control over it. How you are going to control it? So in, in the always block, there's something called sensitivity loops. It means execute this block whenever between these brackets change. Whenever any signal between this bracket changes, this block will run. So it's called, this block is sensitive over the sensitivity list. Okay? So, for the same design. Suppose I want to have the AND or invert design to keep on running forever. Whenever any values of the input change, execute it. Whenever any input changes, execute it. So you need to have an always block. 
always block F, A or B or C or D. Look at the, the box, the second box. So you are defining the selectivity list over this behavior. When will this behavior execute? It will always execute whenever any value in the selectivity list changes. Okay, so this block is called sensitive over the sensitivity list. And you put into your sensitivity list the signals that you are want to be sensitive over. Now make sure that when you write combination in logic, you have to make sure that whatever the behavior inside the always block, anything that changes in your always block has to be in your sensitivity list. So in your always block, you have the assignment of A, B, C, and D. So you have your sensitivity list should have A, B, C, and D. If you don't want to forget that, you can use the asterisk. And asterisk, it means everything in this block that is assigned to, you are sensitive to. Okay? Any question? Okay. So... Let's, let's do a, a, a very fast example on this. So this one is what's from your lecture. It has the, it wants to compute the prime number from four bits, remember? So you have the one, three, five, seven, 13, and 11 are all primes in the four bits, okay? And you created your kind of map, you had your design, right? And you put a sum of product of products of sum. That's what you had in the lecture, okay? So you explicitly put the ands and the ors and the invert, okay? Now you're going to see the beauty of HDL. You don't have to explicitly put how it is designed. No, you are going to say, what do you need? And that you leave this implementation to the tool, okay? So this is the four-bit prime. It's the same, like we said, we have module, you name it prime, and you end it with end module. You define your input, and you define your output. Input in, and output is prime, okay? Then inside the always block, you put, see, look at the always block. Always block is sensitive over the value of in. Whenever the input changes, the four-bit value, whenever it changes, I'm going to check whether it's prime or not. So you have what? Case in. Case is a keyword. If you are not very familiar with programming language, case, case is used to, to check the value between its brackets and check whether it's 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, or 15, or anything else. Okay? It's, uh, look at it as if it's like if, if, else. Okay? Case is another way of writing the if, else. Anyone doesn't know what is a case is? Okay. So you say case if the input has a value of 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, then I say is prime the output equals to 1. Other than that, the default, the output is 0. Did we put any description of the case here? We didn't. We just wrote what? We just wrote what we want. We didn't put the sum product, we didn't put the product sum, no. We wrote what we want. And leave the implementation or the design to the tool. Doing this is just finishing the 4-bit prime number. Okay? This is another way of doing it, but I'm going to, to skip it. Now let's write any question on how we implemented the is prime. Now the test bench. The test bench, remember, we have the stimulus and we have the response. So again, we have the initial begin. At the beginning, I'm putting input equals zero, and you have a keyword called repeat. Repeat 16 times that you have input equal input plus one. So at 16 times you are inputting plus one, one, two, three, four, you are examining all the values of the input. And you are just calling prime, p was u, p zero is an instance of the prime, okay, and you are putting in and is prime. And you display, display just like monitor. Okay, it's the same keyword. So display the value of the input and the value of the output is prime. Okay, and you are seeing it. Does it match what you want or not? And you can see the results on the screen. Okay, when input is equal zero, is prime is zero. When input is one, is prime is one. And it matches what you want. Okay? Now, what is the take from all what I have been saying is that don't try to do the logic yourself. Okay? No. Think what you want 
write it and leave the logic to the tool. It will implement it. Okay? Write what you want, not how it's being done. Okay? Now, the last part is how you are going to describe the FSM in Verilog. So, what we have been talking about so far is combinational, right? You have output that will change whenever the input is going to change. Combinational logic. Now, you want to do a FSM, synchronous sequential circuit. Synchronous sequential circuit is being implemented by RTL, like I said at the beginning of the lecture. Register, transfer, level. You define your combinational logic, you define your register, and whenever you are changing the output or the next state, you are saving it in a register, like the FSM, like the designing of the FSM. That's actually what we are going to do. That you are going to explicitly define the deeply flop. This is what, this is the register. This is the state. This is what's going to save the state. And you are going to define the next state and the output as combinational logic. Okay? And let's see. So I am having an example from the lecture, the one that has the traffic lights. The you have. Um, I don't. Uh, I, I don't know if you remember this example or not. But you have this state machine, and you have uh, how the lights on the cross section is going to change based on the position of the car. So if you have the car as at the east west. It's going, the lights is going to change from green to yellow and so on. Okay, so this was an example in the lecture. And if reset happens, you go to the initial state. Okay, so if not reset, you are going to your state. Else, if it is reset, you're going to the initial state. Okay, and the output, if you remember, was having six bits, okay, the changes of the lights. So we want to implement this using very long. No, don't be scared when looking at this, okay? So, this is the very long description of the FSM. Now, if you look at this block, okay? At the beginning, you define the state value, like what you did exactly in the homeworks, okay? You say that S1, I'm going to um, encode it to 001. S2, I'm going to encode it to 0010, okay? Are you going to encode your state as one hop? or you're going to encode your state as a binary or whatever, okay? So this is exactly the first block. You have how many states? One, two, three, four. You have four states. And you encode it, I remember in the lecture, it say encode the states using one hot encoding. Okay, so I'm giving the states one hot encoding. So there is a keyword in very lock to define constants, or to define values that you want it to be constant to all your design. It's called define. Pick define. So I'm defining the state that's called G and S as four bit value, has having the value one zero zero zero. Do you see what I'm saying? Everyone see what I'm saying? Okay. So you define the encoding of your states. Okay. And also you define the encoding of your outputs. You have one two three four. You have four outputs and they have these values. Okay. So at the beginning, you define the encoding of the states like you're answering the homework. It's exactly the same, okay? And then explicitly, you define the DFF, which is what the sequential part of your program. So remember, FSM has sequential part and the combinational part, right? The combinational part is to define the next state and to define the output, okay? The sequential part is to define what? The register. So you define the register explicitly. You say that I'm having a module called DFF. DFF is your um, choice. It's arbitrary. It's not a keyword in very long. Okay? And you say it's defined input clock, input in, and output called out. And always a positive edge of the clock. So positive edge is a keyword in very long. Whenever the value of the clock change at positive edge, input will go to the out. Does this match the description of the D3 clock? Right? At positive edge, the output will have the values of the input. This is what the output block means. Okay? So here you define the DFF. You define your sequential part explicitly. And then you have another always block that defines your combinational part. This is best practice. Okay? You can define both of them in the same always block. But it's always best practice to define the DFF or define the sequential part by itself and define the 
combination part by itself. Okay? Let's look at the combinational part. Again, so you have what? You have always the same and the value of the car is equal. These were inputs to your state machine. And you put your, what, what you want, what you want to implement. Okay, so you say what? If the state was at G and S, put, look at the figure at the, at the top. If the state was at G and S, then your next state and your output line will have the value what? Remember this line that we took in the lecture? That if car E W is what is true, then next one will take the value Y and S. Look at the figure. <coughs> if car E W, the next state will be Y and S. Do you see it? Okay? And your output will be G and S L. Look at the definition. G and S L was one zero zero one zero 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 one. Okay, do you understand this line? Is it clear? And you define all the states like this. You define the next state and you define the output. Okay? So just to have like a beautiful sentence, sometimes you concatenate them together. Okay, but you can have them on different sides. So you see the, the, the curly brackets. You say I'm I'm defining next one and I'm defining lights in the same in the same line, but that you can put it in two different lines. Okay? And then you have another one, also it's best practice to define the reset in a separate line. Meaning that, remember, all the always blocks are running in parallel. All of them are running in parallel. So the DFF, the module, that's always a constant block, is always running. The combination of logic is always running. So you have to make sure whenever reset happens, it, it makes what? It interrupts both modules. So you have it outside your own block of the combination logic. Make sure that the reset signal is outside your combination logic. So you make sure that actually it's always one as well. So you may assign next equal if reset is two, it's going to GNS, the initial state. Else it's going to your next state, who's called next one. Okay? I know it's a big code, but I just want to make sure to highlight that you have to define the combination logic alone, the DFF alone, the reset signal alone. Okay, and if you have any question on this, you can of course come to me, just look at it again and, and, and ask me if you have any question. Okay, so I have five minutes left. Someone raised his hands. Any question? Okay, so there is a tool called um, EDA Playground. And it is actually cloud-based, so you can, you just need an explorer, you just need internet connection, okay? And you write your Verilog, you write your test bench, and you simulate it, and you see the results, okay? It's a very, very nice tool, you don't have to download anything for it, and it's uh, used, you will use it, okay, to make sure that your design works correctly. It's called EDA Playground, so... <coughs> Go to, when you, like, later on, go to EDA Playground, make an account. You will see that there are two windows. One of them, you put your design, your various code, and you put your test bench, and you will see the compilation and simulation results. In. And actually, it can make synthesis as well. It can generate the gates that can be used to be downloaded on the FBGA. Okay? So, most importantly, you have to think before you code. Remember our flow chart? You have to analysis, analyze, you have to partition things before you code. Okay? Now, these are all my references. So, there is um, a very nice training called Dulles. Actually, EDA Playground is based on Dulles and uh, the lectures, of course. And this is the end, but I want to. Uh, this is your laptop. I want to show them the EDA Playground, how it works. So but, uh, oh, you want to use it? Mm, yeah. That's okay. Maybe later after Paul, I will try to set up. I want to show them how the EDA playground works. Okay.
Okay. So this is how the the very log the EDA playground looks like. You see login, so you have to make an account. Okay. Uh, it's nice to have an account because it will save all your design. Whenever you put a new design, it will save it to your account. So you have a list of all your designs. Okay. At the right corner, you put the very log code, the design. So I put the 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 very log code of the track and flight. Okay. The same thing that I've just been explaining. I put it here. Okay. And on the left side in the left block you have the test bench you write your test bench so i have the initial remember i have the initial block and i put in it the pattern of the inputs that i want to change and i will monitor the output in you'll see here the display this one this is the monitor so the stimulus is input stimulus as you can see and i'm changing the input and i'm monitoring the output okay so here you say you see that there is test bench and ver um, test bench and design is using system Verilog and Verilog, and you ch there are a lot of tools for the simulation. Choose any one. So for example, Riviera, this one. So it's a simulation tool for a special type of FBGA for Altera. But yeah, you choose a tool for the simulation. Okay. And this is the details. This is you name your design for something so that later on you know what it's called. And you put a description for it, okay? And then you see run. If you press run, let's see here. Let's see. Run. Will it uh, go to your account, right? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Run. So after I press run, what do I see? Look, kernel, view, x and z, you see like don't care, and don't care, this is what this is, the result of the display. You see the display in the code? So I'm displaying the reset, the car input output, the lights, and the state. What is the current state? And I'm seeing it in the values. Okay, so you can always test whether your design works as you want or not in the simulation. Okay, so the simulation print on the screen, you can see what it works, how it works. Another way to test if, you, if your design is working correctly or not is to examine the waveform. Yeah. Here I print it. You can actually see the waveform. So EDA Playground allows you to do that if you make sure that you do this. Open EP Wave after run. Okay, you click on this it will open for you the EP wave. Inside it, you get the signals that you want to see. So I have my test FSM, which is the name of the test bench, and I say that I want to see the clock, the reset, the inputs, and the outputs, the lights, everything. So let's say append all, okay? And you can see the wave action. You can see when the clock change with the car east-west, which is the input, how the lights change, the output. And whenever reset happen, will the state change or not? Okay, so this is another way to see if your design is working correctly or not, by looking at the wave itself. And you can always change the radix, whether you want to see the values on the wave as, what, as hex or as binary. So you will see that the values here has changed binary you can view it as hex okay and yeah that's it's it's a nice tool to try it so try the and or invert when you go home and make sure that you go through this process okay and any question Okay, this tool actually also do the centers, but because we are concising for special FPGA, so Paul was going to tell you how you're going to do the centers on, on the FPGA. So, so far what I have been explaining is what? Designing the Verilog test bench, how to test your Verilog before you go to the centers to the gates, how actually you're going to download your Verilog to the gates, and that's what, what Paul is going to show you. Any question? Okay, thank you.
A language description can be pretty dry, but unfortunately, there's no other way around it. Uh, and uh, what Salma described is like one hundredth of what Verilog is, uh, but you don't need kind of a full glory of Verilog for uh, the language. So, so let's take a five minute break.